Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On Wednesday night in Los Angeles, a company called Inversion unveiled a vehicle called the Ark. This is supposed to be a hypersonic lifting body cargo carrier able to deliver uh, cargo of whatever sort you want to put into it anywhere in the world inside an hour, assuming that you actually have a satellite already lined up. I'll be honest, I didn't watch their stream live because uh, I was at a pub quiz winning 50 bucks. It's not rocket science, it's a whole lot more difficult than that. Especially when uh, the quizmaster doesn't understand that a meteoroid and an asteroid are technically the same thing. Anyway, uh, later I did actually watch the preview animation showing the concept of operation. You have this little spacecraft in orbit, it's sort of a lifting body shape, there's some dude with a fancy laptop sending a signal to the satellite which then jettisons its uh, cruise stage, performs a 180 and then fires its engines, and I'm going to say, I think you should probably change the order of operations here. Uh, yeah, then fires up its onboard engines, slows down, and then starts descending through the atmosphere. And by the way, apparently this animation was done by uh, the team behind Real Engineering. So anyway, by being a hypersonic lifting body, it is able to maneuver, it's able to perform S-turns to control its range, to get cross-range, to bring itself over the target, and then once it gets close, it can pop out a power glider and glides gently down to its target on the ground. In this case, they're showing fires, and I guess we're supposed to imagine that there's some sort of disaster and there are people on site that can take advantage of this thing's special delivery. So anyway, this whole design is a lot like a cargo-capable version of the X-38 that was developed. And we've talked about this concept before because, of course, the US is talking about uh, rocket-based cargo systems. And while everyone's drawing pictures of Starship, this actually makes a whole lot more sense. And so I figured you guys might want to hear me talk about this. But also, those of you who remember the old school days of this channel, well, I think you might like to see me do it in Kerbal Space Program because that is something which very much made this channel happen. It gave me a platform to talk about stuff in space and building something like this, well, your Kerbal Space Program's great at it. It also gives me an excuse to build a new install of Kerbal Space Program with Black Rack's uh, amazing cloud mods, the parallax graphics. The failure of the sequel has only meant that the mods for the original have become all the more important. So yeah, over the last few years, we've heard a lot of different companies getting involved in rocket cargo projects with uh, DARPA. Uh, you know, we've all had sort of gone back and forth. SpaceX were obviously the favorite early on, but Starship isn't necessarily the best solution to the problems that they're looking at. Starship is very big and it probably doesn't land, you know, in random places particularly well right now. The only places we've actually seen Starship land are either on its legs at back at Starbase or in, like, the Indian Ocean. It's a vehicle designed for reusability, whereas when you're wanting to deliver a bunch of supplies to the middle of nowhere, you may not want to have something that can be reused. We've seen a number of companies developing return capsules for you know, manufacturing running experiments in space. That all makes uh, plenty of sense and they can be certainly landed with some level of precision because they're able to put them inside uh, landing ranges. But if they can be steered through re-entry, then they can control their landing site with much greater precision. So that's where the idea of a lifting body begins to make much more sense, becomes much more attractive to uh, you know, as a service. And while a lifting body could, in theory, have undercarriage and land on a runway, if you are potentially sending these to an austere environment where they can't clear several thousand feet of flat terrain for a, a landing vehicle, uh, it makes much more sense to have it land under a parachute, under a canopy. And the idea of having a paraglider that can deploy and then steer it gently down to a very precise landing site that's where this starts to make sense. Now, as I said, the X-38 was a spacecraft which was being developed for the International Space Station. It was supposed to be a return vehicle, a life pod or an escape pod for astronauts. And it would also use lifting body to glide to a broad location. And then once it slowed down enough, it would deploy a paraglider and land with uh, some precision. 
So this combination of features, as we said, it's been talked about before and it's the one that always made the most sense for Rocket Cargo. So seeing a company taking this and then saying, actually, we would like to do something even more crazy. They would like to have a mega constellation of delivery ships already with the cargo on board. And hypothetically, if you had enough satellites up there, you would just find out which one was going to have a pass within its cross-range capability and order it to fire its engine so it would come down over and then it would guide itself down and land the cargo exactly where you want it to. And by the way, yeah, this uh, parachute, this power glider in Kerbal Space Program is way overpowered. It's part of the Kines mod and should not be considered realistic at all. So how big a constellation would you need? Well, imagine you have 1,000 kilometer cross-range capability, you know, left or the right of your orbit. Uh, if you consider that the circumference of the Earth is about 40,000 kilometers, that's 2,000 kilometers per spacecraft, and then, of course, you have to account for inclination. It's no more than 20 planes of uh, satellites. Uh, if you want to have one-hour delivery, you would need at least two satellites per orbit. So for one specific product, you would need about 40 spacecraft in orbit. And then that means, in theory, the first one could come within an hour, but then you could have up to 40 over the next 24 hours. And the kind of payloads that they talk about carrying, well, they put up this nice, like, uh, you know, slide showing a list of things. And that list seems to go on forever. But actually, if you look very carefully, they just loop it. And I am sure that if you ask the US military, would you like the ability to deliver this equipment anywhere in the world with one hour's notice, they would say yes. And then you would tell them the price and they might think a little longer. They had a great little video showing the precision guidance of their power glider systems. They, you know, they basically drop a couple of them off the back of a plane and then they then choose to glide down to this individual target sites. I think it's interesting that they flew two at the same time. I guess, you know, they're imagining a future where you have multiple of these things all coordinating and coming down together. And of course, announcing their arrival with sonic booms and big parachutes. I'm not sure how reliably this could be put into an area where, uh, you know, the area was not secure, but as they, they show at least they can put these things down with some precision. I don't doubt that uh, these kind of vehicles could be built and uh, that the team has the ability to do this. It sounds like they've got fairly talented people in there. The question really is, would the US spend a lot of money building this and flying this. Like given the size and the mass of the spacecraft, I wouldn't be surprised if you could put, say, a dozen of these on a Falcon 9. So you, it would only take a handful of launches to build out a full like constellation for a specific item. But then, of course, you can need to keep on delivering replacements every five years. Now, instead, you could do a launch on demand system, but again, you have to be concerned about the possibility of a cargo launch being mistaken for a ballistic missile launch. They are going to be pretty much indistinguishable. And indeed, a re-entering vehicle is going to be essentially indistinguishable from like a hypersonic glide warhead, which is designed to target a specific area. So if the US was to deploy such a system, they would probably have to have some interesting diplomatic agreements whereby they probably would let other nuclear powers verify that they weren't actually putting nuclear warheads on these things. Every now and then, the US has talked about putting conventional warheads on ICBMs, and this is always the situation that they come back to. That they can't really do that because it could be mistaken for a nuclear warhead, which has very bad consequences if your adversaries mistake your conventional weapon for a nuclear strike. And so after the animations, the promises of one-hour del uh, delivery worldwide, uh, there was one interesting thing that actually does give them a real business case, at least in the near future, and that is they've signed a you know, substantial agreement with Kratos for you know, hypersonic testing because their vision of their vehicle is going to be sitting in the hypersonic domain for a whole lot longer than a lot of the other options. Of course, they have to actually get their vehicle working, which will be a bunch of hypersonic testing in and of itself. Now, 
the the design uh it just is sort of your standard lifting body shape there's not really any fins there are a number of flaps at the back which control the airflow coming off the rear it looks like there's an offset center of mass which uh, gives them a pitch up moment it looks a lot like the european space rider concept which uh, you know has has been tested has flown to space and come back demonstrating control capability so between that and the X-38, there's actually a whole lot of heritage that at least inspired the design. They're not starting from zero with a completely blank slate. They also previously flew a return capsule on a transporter mission. They flew like a standard, uh, you know, non-guided capsule called Ray. And so Ray was a whole lot smaller. It was about 63 kilograms. And unfortunately, they had some technical issues. Uh, they were unable to get to test their re-entry, so it is currently still in orbit, still in sun-synchronous orbit, and I'm guessing it's decaying, and at some point it's eventually going to come home, but as of, you know, right now, literally right now, it is still orbiting the Earth. So the way I see it is they've come up with this presentation for the technology they want to develop and get investors in on it. Uh, it seems to sort of dovetail nicely with the U.S.'s space uh, cargo transportation or rocket cargo transportation uh, endeavors. Uh, uh, but I won't be surprised if what they actually end up doing with it changes a whole lot more because I'm not hundred. I'm not convinced that the constellation idea actually makes sense. It does make sense if you have way too much money, and we all know that the U.S. military has a lot of money. And you know, the U.S. military, a lot of people. Uh, don't quite appreciate that one of the things the U.S. military is most capable of is logistics. That is like its superpower. Sure, it has all sorts of interesting aircraft and weapon systems and things like that, but it has the ability to move all these military assets and other assets using military you know, transportation across the world to where it's supposed to be in relatively short order in a way that uh, other you know, armed forces really uh, can't compare. And so if you're to ask, like, what is the innovation in logistics that might, you know, make a difference in the next conflict? Your know, rocket cargo sort of still fits into that, even if it does seem far, uh, far fetched. And as a player of another video game, uh, EVE Online, what that game taught me was that while individual battles can be swayed by the right fit, the right tactics and stuff, the things that ultimately win the wars are the logistics that brings everyone to the right place where they're needed. And that's why I won't be surprised if on future battlefields we do in fact see vehicles like this with uh, large power gliders delivering cargo that took off less than an hour ago from halfway across the world. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.